Acts chapter 17 is where we are today. Acts chapter 17 as we continue our series through the journeys of Paul this summer. So good to be back with you uh, this week. Uh, But don't think it was like a vacation or anything. We were in South Louisiana last week. And if you've ever been to South Louisiana during the summer, I know we have some Cajuns with us. God bless you. But my son played a baseball tournament and then we decided to stay and I don't know why, but we did, and it was hot, so uh, so glad to be back here with you. Acts chapter 17, if you have your Bible and you're able, would you stand with me as we read the very words of God? Acts chapter 17, we're going to start in verse 1, pick up where James so wonderfully and masterfully preached from last week. I'm so grateful for him and all of our staff, honestly. Um, uh, but that's where we are this morning, Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Hear now the words of God. Now, when they had passed through Amphilios and Apollina, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ." And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a many, great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. Look at verse 6. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason And some of the brothers before the city authorities shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them. They are all acting against the decrees of Caesar saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken some money, security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Let's pray. Father God, we pray this morning and we ask, God, that you would help us to understand from this story, God, our place in your ministry. God, our place in the overarching story of the gospel going forth to the ends of the earth. God, you would let us and empower us to take the reins as you so desire. Lord, I pray this morning as the preacher that you would stand in my body, think with my mind, and speak with my tongue all you would have us to know and to say and to do. We'll give you the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. At the age of 47, the writer William Gilliard's dad died in a tragic motorcycle accident. He says, you know, my, my dad was a good guy. He was a decent man. But every Sunday when our, church, or our family went to church, our dad went and rode his motorcycle. And so on the day of his dad's crash, he went, the coroner invited him to go out to the scene of the accident and to kind of see the wreckage, identify the body. And he went straight from there, he went straight over to the, to the shop. And he said, I'll never remember my dad's kind of famous words to me. He always said, live to ride. He said, my uncle and I went to the shop where his club was based out of. And he said, it's like when we walked in, all of the mechanics kind of bowed their heads as if a comrade had died, as if someone from their inner circle had died. And then he said, one of the mechanics, as we were getting ready to leave, looked at us to try to comfort us. And here's what he said. Your dad went out doing what he loved, and that's the only way to die. It's honorable. The son sat there and thought about that for a second, and he looked up at the mechanic, and he said this, and I quote, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. My dad did not go out in an honorable way. His family was sitting in church worshiping the Lord. He was out on a motorcycle going as fast as he could with people who he cared about and loved more than his family, and he has left us all behind to pick up the pieces. That is not an honorable thing to do. 
Later in life, he was reminiscing on this moment as he began to wrestle with his own life and his own legacy. And he began to think, what kind of mark will I leave on this earth as a believer? And then he thought back to his dad and he thought back to the great opportunity missed. This man could have left a legacy. He could have helped change the world, but instead he wrapped his motorcycle around a tree and the only legacy to him will be a headstone in a cemetery somewhere because he did nothing with what God gave him. I think that's interesting as we think about the life of the believer. Everybody in the room or watching at home is called to something great. Now, I'm not talking about spiritual gifts. I'm not talking about your strengths. I'm not talking about your weaknesses. I'm not called to an, or talking about an individual calling. I'm talking about the one call that all Christians, all places, in all times have been called to. And this is our jumping off point. And this is what we see in Paul. I want you to look at it. We're going to walk through it and then we'll give some points. But I want you to see, here's what Christians are called to. Down in verse 6, it says this. These men who have turned the world upside down. Listen to me. That's what you're called to do. And I'll explain how in a minute. But just for a moment, let that soak in. I don't care if you're eight. I don't care if you're 85. You are called, you are empowered, and you are equipped to turn the world upside down. I'm afraid too many Christians, perhaps even sitting in this room, and this has definitely been true of my life at certain points, so many Christians are just looking forward to getting from point A to B from this life, let, let's get it over and, and let's get to eternity, that we forget that we're called to something great. We're called to something better. We're not called just to make it through life. We are called, hear this very carefully, to turn the world upside down. It has nothing to do with your ability to speak, nothing to ability to preach, to read, or comprehend. It has everything to do with the Lord who works in you and through you to change the world. But you didn't think that this morning when you got up, did you? I bet the first thing you didn't think was, okay, today, my job as a teenage boy, a teenage girl, as an 80-year-old man, as a 50-year-old, that my job today is to turn the world upside down. It is. Students, it is. Your job is to turn the world upside down. Moms, your job is to turn the world. Dads, your job is to turn the world. Grandparents, listen to me. Your job is to turn the world upside down, even as a grandparent. Why? Because turning the world upside down is getting the gospel to people who will perish lest they have it. Let's just walk through this. We'll use that as a launching point. Look back at verse 1. Keep in mind, they're saying that these guys are turning the world upside down. But here's what you need to know. <laughs> Paul's only been in ministry for a few weeks. Keep in mind, Paul was saved, spent about three years studying the scripture, and then in a few weeks, he's accused of turning the world upside down. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of hyperbole in there. He's not really turning the world upside down, but for them and their world, he's turning it upside down. Think about your world for a second. When you think about your world, you think about your husband, your wife, and your kids. That's your world, right? I mean, I, sure, India's out there and China, but for you, your world is your home, your family. Your, that's where it revolves around. And so when they're thinking about the whole world here, they're thinking about their slice, if you will. They're thinking about their context, and they're thinking these guys are coming in with this different gospel, and they are turning the world upside down because they knew where it would go. If it's caught on like wildfire here this quickly, imagine what it'll do to the rest of the world. And so... When they had passed through, by the way, Paul just got out of jail. He went to jail for the gospel. Now, they, he healed, but nonetheless, it was in Jesus' name. So he goes to prison, as James so wonderfully preached last week. He goes to prison, and what does he do in prison? He preaches the gospel, and what happens? People are saved. He turns the jail upside down. And so now he takes this about a 100-mile journey in the span of about three days. It's about 30 miles one day, about 28 miles the next day, about 36 or something the next day. So it's about a hundred mile journey here. And of course he had to have had a horse or something like that. But nonetheless, he is beat feeding to get the gospel to where it's not. And look what he does. And when Paul went in as his custom on the Sabbath, 
he reasoned with them from Scripture, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. How does Paul turn the world upside down? He doesn't go in and overthrow the local government. Paul does not encourage all the believers to get to the voting booth in November. Is voting important? Yes. Will voting overturn the world for the gospel? No. And so he goes in with a very simple gospel message. And some of them were what? Persuaded, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, and joined Paul and Silas, as did many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous. Why were they jealous? Well, they had these brand new Gentile converts to Judaism who were flooding their pews, and now all of a sudden they're exiting. They hear the gospel and they leave. They go to the truth. And then also some of these leading Jewish women, by the way, that could have meant, meant a couple of things. It could have meant that they were, uh, they were just Jewish women that would have been held in higher regard in the Gentile society. It could have been that they were married to Jewish leaders. Um, even Nero's wife was known as kind of a leading sympathizer of the Jews. And so that could mean anything, um, but we probably just think it means prominent women in the community. But they were saved and they started following, but that couldn't happen. They rose up against them. See, they were accusing them of turning the world upside down. Now the crowd's turning the world upside down. And they go after Jason. We don't know who Jason is, by the way. Just a guy who took in some missionaries. But nonetheless, they threaten him. They drag him. They charge him. But all of this goes down to what? These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And the implication there is to turn this one upside down also. How does he do it? This is, look, this is simple. He does it with the gospel. I'm a parent of two small children, both in elementary school, so I'm kind of in the parenting groups. And all of the time I hear, and this is probably true, man, our schools are in trouble. It doesn't matter if you're in Bryant, Little Rock, it doesn't matter where you are. Benton, I mean, you always hear that. Hey, man, we got to have more of a Christian influence in our schools. It's true. Or, or you hear about how our country's in a mess all the time. I don't even watch cable news anymore because it made me anxious. But nonetheless, yeah, it's true that our world is in trouble. What do we do about it? And how do we fix things? How do we make a better tomorrow for our kids? We turn the world upside down. But how do we do it? Well, there's three ways that you and I, every believer who is called to preach the gospel, if you're hearing my voice, you're called to preach the gospel. If you're hearing my voice and you're a Christian, you're called to turn the world upside down. Therefore, if we aren't doing that, we aren't doing what we've been saved to. But there's three ways that we can turn the world upside down. Students, there's three ways you can turn this, this world upside down. Dads, there's three ways you can turn the world upside down. You ready? Number one, you have to have courage amidst adversity. You have to have courage amidst adversity. Paul was a courageous man. Paul gets out of jail, knows that there's a warrant out for his head, and he travels 100 miles as fast as he can to the second leading city in all of Europe, Macedonia at the time, and he preached the gospel. I've never been to prison, full disclaimer. But I can tell you this, just knowing my nature, if I had been to prison, as soon as I got out, I would lay low for a while. Like, I would go home, I'd shut the door, I would probably cry for a while, thinking I never want to go back to that place again. You know, they were mean to me and all this. Um, and then I would probably be cool, right? I, I just wouldn't do anything wrong for a while. Paul gets out of prison for preaching the gospel and immediately goes back to preaching the gospel. That is courage. He says, do with me what you will, but I will preach Christ and I will preach Christ crucified. That's true courage. Well, you say, well, Paul was always courageous, right? I mean, he used to kill Christians. What? Well, that's cynical because here's what. Paul was not courageous when he was killing Christians. Paul had power from the government. There's a big difference. There's a big difference in, you know, going to a gunfight with a gun and going to a gunfight with a water pistol. One's courageous, <laughs> one's dumb. Paul would go around and he would kill Christians, but he had the full backing of the government. 
Paul would go out to kill Christians and he had guards with him. Paul just didn't walk into a church by himself and say, here we go. He could hide behind that power. He's like the little brother who picks a fight and then gets behind his big brother. That's not courage. That's power. Paul was courageous in that he walked into the lion's den and he spoke the gospel, that which would get him arrested, that which would ultimately lead to his martyrdom. He spoke the gospel. That is courage when you don't have protection and doing it anyways. And that's what he does. He makes this journey and and they're mad at him. See, when Paul converted to Christianity, he lost all power. When Paul converted to Christianity, he went from being, you know, the 007 of the state to being the enemy of the state. Yet he did it anyways. It wasn't in vogue to be a believer at work, but he did it anyways. It wasn't cool sitting at the ballpark and everybody talking about this and to be a believer. It wasn't fun and hip and cool when all of your friends are doing this and you're talking about, like, it was not cool. It was dangerous. And Paul did it anyways. He was courageous. This is what you're called to. Hear me very carefully. And I'm afraid in 2022, we have lost our courage. This is what we're called to. We are called to walk right into the belly of the beast and preach the gospel. Because if the gospel is not preached, hear this very carefully, people will not be saved. So we have to determine in our own minds and our own hearts right now, are we okay with people perishing without the gospel? We're called to be courageous. But let me just say this before I go to number two. This isn't something you're going to form in the gym. This isn't something that you have to get your mind right about. This isn't something that you have to practice. This is something outside of yourself. This is something that the Lord does. This is a courage that God gives you. This is a courage that only he can equip you with. We see this in the Old Testament a lot. In fact, you can flip if you want over to Genesis chapter 15. And we see this right here. Abram has just basically gone to battle with Sodom and Gomorrah to rescue his nephew Lot. He's outgunned, outmatched, outran, out, out everything. But here's what God says after his victory in 15 and 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. <clears throat> what was the courage that Abram had? It was God. What is the courage that Abraham had to walk into the face of a fire and not get burned? It was God. God is his shield. He is his refuge. But above all that, God is his power. So when we think about courage, it's very simple like this. Having courage to do what God has already called you to do is just Two simple things, you ready? It's believing that God can and believing that God will empower you. Catch that. It's believing that God can, but not only can he, it's believing that he will. So that when I go into that situation and I know the gospel needs to be proclaimed, I'm not saying, man, do I have the strength? I'm saying God can and he's about to. Number two, not only to turn the world upside down, do we have to have courage amidst We also have to have this. We have to have conviction among clutter. Write that down. Conviction among clutter. Have you noticed how the truth has become difficult? I've talked about this about a month ago. The truth has become difficult to articulate for some reason in society. Two plus two used to add up to four. Who knows what it adds up to anymore? It's like the color blue, right? And so we have to, though, As believers of Jesus Christ, if we want to turn the world upside down, we have to have conviction when nobody has truth to open our mouth and let the truth come out. Because if I'm I'm not mistaken, the truth saves. Let me say it again. If I'm not mistaken, the truth saves. If I'm not mistaken, it's the gospel that saves. If I'm not mistaken, it's the gospel that reconciles sinners to God. Am I wrong? 
And so we have to have a conviction amidst all of this plurality and all of this pluralism to say, Jesus loves you and God saves. Let's look at it. Look back at the text. Verse 2, and Paul went in, as was his custom, and on the three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined. Paul was not trying to get them to see things like he saw them. Paul was not trying to convince them that they were even wrong. Paul was trying to convince them that Jesus is the only way. But he could not do that if he did not open his mouth. And that's what you have to do. If we want people to mix through all the clutter and to hear the gospel, that's not going to happen if we don't speak it. Let me just break it down like this. The gospel will never go forth to our neighbors if it never goes forth out of our mouth. But Matt, I'm not Paul. I, I don't... I don't have any fancy degrees, or I'm not a great speaker. I don't know a lot. Thank you for saying that. Let me help you look through this. Neither was Paul. Flip over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to show you how Paul did this and how you can do this also. Because every Christian is called to do this. It's not whether we're called, it's whether we're willing. Here's what Paul did. Here's how Paul preached. I want you to hear this. When Paul went to the synagogue, when Paul stood on the street corner, when Paul would just walk down the streets, hear how he spoke. Look at it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the, uh, did not proclaim to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of the power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Let me put that just in a little bit more crude layman's terms. The church at Corinth, Corinth in general, is the hub of all... um, oratory. It's where all of the great speakers come from. Augustine, all of those people came through here. This was the hub of speech. This is where all of the greatest preachers of all time came through, but none of them were Christians. And so they would get out there and they would convince you to listen to them because they were such good speakers, but they were saying nothing. And so what does Paul do? He does the opposite. In fact, the church at Corinth was embarrassed by Paul because of how weak he was. They were embarrassed by how feeble he was. They were embarrassed that he didn't use enough inflection. They were embarrassed that his rate wasn't good. They were embarrassed that he didn't use his hands enough like all the other ones. Man, why don't you just preach like them? And Paul said, because it's not the preaching that's important. It's the words. So no, none of us are gifted speakers like some of the best of all times. And if you're anything like me, you don't have answers to all of life's questions. If you're anything like me, your palms get sweaty and you get nervous. But if we're anything like Paul, we can trust that he who saved us is going to use us. All we have to do is open our mouth and speak the gospel and let God figure out the rest. If we do not speak the gospel, the gospel will not go forth. Look what it says there. Paul, through his speaking, some were what? persuaded. Some were persuaded. See, that was Paul's task. Paul wasn't arguing anybody into heaven. He wasn't manipulating them. He was persuading them. Here's the difference in persuasion and manipulation. Persuasion lays out all the facts. Here's everything you need to go. A, B, C, D. Here's the truth. Now, what do you want to do with it? Here's why you need it. Now, here's what are you going to do? Manipulation plays on your fears. Manipulation plays on your worries. Manipulation pulls out your heartstrings and it tries to get you all tied up so then you have nothing else but to make a decision out of desperation. Paul said, I'm not here to do that. I'm here to persuade you with the truth of the gospel and let the Lord convict you. And Paul loved to persuade people. That's what we do. And it's almost like we're begging people Be reconciled to God is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.20. By the mercies of God, 
be reconciled. Paul laid out the gospel and the truth prevailed. Here's what I want you to know. The truth will prevail. How do we know? Look around. The truth prevailed at least in these lives. How do we know the truth prevails? Because the church is growing in places where truth is so censored throughout the world that it's not even funny how fast it's growing. But why? Because they're opening their mouth and they're speaking the words of God. Well, man, I'm not articulate. I don't know great things. Open your mouth and let God speak. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, I think is a great comfort to this. It says this, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit and of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. Your job is not to convince anyone Your job is to open your mouth and let the words of God do what it does. Paul says this in Romans 10, faith comes by hearing. Open your mouth and let the words of truth of the gospel come out. How do you do that? You gotta have three things. Number one, you gotta know it. Man, we can't preach the gospel if we don't know the gospel. Know it, rehearse it, memorize it. Number two, you have to normalize it in conversation. You have to normalize it. If you're married and you've been married for any long term here, you know that you and your wife or you and your spouse can talk about anything, even the most awkward things. Why? Because those kind of things have been normalized over time. It's the same with the gospel. The more we normalize ourselves with the gospel and the more our conversation is normalized with it, the more it becomes a normal process of our lives. The more we open our mouth and it just accidentally comes out. We're not putting our foot in our mouth. We're putting the gospel in our mouth. So you have to know it. You have to normalize it. But you also have to be intentional. If you're going to share the gospel, if you're going to turn the world upside down, it's not going to happen by accident. I'm I'm not really a goal setter per se. Like I set goals every January for five days and that's about it. But one thing I do is I set a goal for evangelism. Every month I write down, here's how many times this month outside of just kind of supernatural encounters the Lord's going to give me. Here's how many times I'm going to share the gospel this month. Is that legalism? No, it's forcing me and it's holding me accountable to doing it. Once again, there's plenty of other times it just happens. But nonetheless, if I don't remind myself and if I don't keep it on my forefront, I'm not going to do it. Set a goal. Lord, this week I want to share the gospel four times, one time. Lord, my goal by the end of this month is to have a talk with my son about the gospel. Because we have to get through the clutter with the conviction of the gospel. Number three, it's around third and head home here. So not only do we have conviction among clutter, but we also have to have concern for the perishing. We have to have concern for the perishing. I probably told you this story once again the older I get, the more stories I have. So just, I told somebody, if you'll just hang around 30 more years, by then I'll have a lot of new stories. But several years ago, I was preaching a revival um, in Denison, Texas, which is way up on the Oklahoma border. It took me forever to get there from Dallas. But I was preaching this revival. And during the days of the revival, I would go out with a deacon generally, and we would do door-to-door evangelism. One day, this deacon and I were together, and he was driving, and he said, hey, let's go by the store first, get something to drink. I said, fine. So he gets back in the car, and he says, can I tell you something? I said, sure, I guess you can tell me whatever you want. I remember the guy's name. He said, I really don't want to do this. I said, okay, fair enough. I was thinking to myself, he's probably just scared or nervous. Like, I get it. I am too. Like, who loves to go cold, you know, knock on doors? Here's what he said. He said, I don't want to do it because I just don't care if people go to hell. Oh, me, that's exactly right. I said, what? Deacon in the church. He said, and I, he's like, and he was a nice guy. He said, I just don't care. He's like, people can do whatever they want. I said, okay, <laughs> let's work through this a little bit. Um, I was like a 24-year-old seminary student, knew all the answers in the world, but couldn't articulate anything. I said, what do you mean? He's like, man, at the end of the day, I don't care if people go to heaven or hell. I just don't care. 
That's a true story. And man, that sounds awful, doesn't it? Can I just, can I just preach for a second? Can I preach? I think he said what so many of us practice. I think he articulated what the American church has become comfortable with. Yeah, sure, heaven and hell exist, but at the end of the day, let's eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die. So it's shocking as that may be, I wonder if we functionally live our lives like that. We have to have concern for the perishing, but concern has to be the gospel. Wrongly, I believe, and I'm not one to question church fathers, but wrongly, St. Francis of Assisi said, share the gospel always when necessary, use words. Let me say this very carefully. It's always necessary to use words. Always necessary to use words. Acts of service are incredible, and we should do them, but at the end of the day, an act of service won't get anybody into heaven. It's the gospel that saves. We have to have concern for the perishing. We have to have concern for those people who, like Jonah said in the belly of the well in Jonah 2.7, my life was perishing, but I remembered the Lord. We are alive men looking at dead men who need to teach them how to be alive. That's what Paul does. He looks at people with concern, with content, but ultimately with the gospel. Paul cared very deeply about Jesus, but more importantly, Paul cared very deeply that other people knew Jesus. Why do you think people are unevangelistic? Man, why do you, what do you think the roadblocks are to us not turning the world upside down? I think it's a couple of things. I think, number one, as we just shared, I think the reason more Christians don't turn the world upside down is because they do not care. Do you know who the Great Commission was given to? All of us. We're all charged to make disciples of all nations, so we have to determine either we're going to do what Jesus says or we're not. I think a lot of people just frankly don't have concern for those that are perishing I think another one, I think there are too many Christians that harbor bitterness. Let me tell you right now, there is nothing that will stagnate your faith more than being bitter. I think another reason people fail to turn the world upside down or even see the need is because they refuse to forgive other people. Let me just tell you this about refusing to forgive other people. When you refuse to forgive other people, you're giving someone else the power over you that God deserves. And chances are, they don't even know. But, but when we do that, when we're wrapped so much up in our feelings, we control the center of our world and not the Lord. It becomes a hamper. And I think, I think the greatest reason people aren't turning the world upside down, you ready for it? Dot, 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 is because we always have an excuse. We always have an excuse why we can't. Once again, I've said this before. I'm going to say this every week. There's a lot of sinners in this room, but the chief sinner of all stands behind this pulpit. And I'm the worst about having an excuse about why I can't. Well, I'm busy. Well, that person does not seem interested. Well, they certainly don't look like they'd be interested in Jesus. You know, they say good intentions pave the way to hell, but so do good excuses. Good excuses pave the way to hell for a lot of people. So what we have to develop for ourselves is a concern for the lost. A concern when we look in people's eyes, when we look in our grandchildren's eyes, when we look in our neighbor's eyes, a concern for their eternity. How do we do that? I think number one, I think you have to meditate on the heart of Jesus for the lost. Luke 19.10, I think this is a verse that you should underline, highlight, whatever. But here's what Jesus says. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Becoming more like Jesus and less like ourselves is having more of a heart for the lost. So meditate on the words of Jesus, on the heart for Jesus for the lost. Number two, pray for concern. Pray for con Lord, break me every day over lostness around me. Number three, you want to know how to become a, a, a world turn upside downer? 
Spend time with people already doing it. You want to be more evangelistic? Spend time with people who are evangelistic. The best way to learn how to frame a house, the best way to learn how to fix a car is to spend time with a mechanic or a carpenter. The best way to learn how to turn the world upside down is to spend time with somebody already doing it. Our students go on mission trips and they come back fired up, ready to take hell on with a water hose. Why? Because they've been together in an evangelistic context and they're doing it. We spend time with others and it rubs off. And then number four, here's what you have to understand about turning the, king, or the world upside down. You ready? This is going to blow your mind and this is done. I'm done. Turning the world upside down is normal Christian behavior. Let me say it again. Turning the world upside down is normal Christian behavior. This is what we're called to do. We are called to make disciples of all nations by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's the question. What is your legacy? Everybody's going to have a funeral at some point. Let me just bring this down for a minute. Uh, And there's going to be a guy that stands up and says nice things about you. Even if they don't know you, they're going to say nice things about you. I'm not talking about that kind of legacy. I'm talking about when you leave this world, will your legacy still continue on in the lives of everyone and those people that you led to Jesus, that you discipled, and that you helped turn the world upside down? We are called to be people who turn the world upside down. The question is, will you? Let me read this quote, and I'm done. One of my favorite preachers is uh, a guy named um, Charles Spurgeon. If you know anything about Charles Spurgeon, he was a early Baptist preacher in England, but he says this, and I'll leave you with this. I want you to listen as carefully as you can. Lean in even. Charles Spurgeon says this. If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let not one go unwarned or unprayed for. (laughs) Are you ready to turn the world upside down? This, you, we are God's plan for turning the world upside down, lest no man should perish without Jesus. Let's pray.